One of the things I picked up off the street recently was this TV tuner. Is it useful for amateur radio projects in 2022? Keep watching and find out. I would date this tuner around the late 1960s to early 1970s. As you can see by its small size, there's no protruding valves, so it's all solid state. Transistors became efficient for VHF from about the late 1960s. The other thing is that it's only VHF. Australia was a late comer in getting both colour TV and UHF. They were both introduced, colour in 1975 and UHF in late 1970s, early 1980s. So I would say this tuner is late 60s to early 70s and it's VHF only. Now what is a TV tuner? It's basically a converter. It converts signals coming in from the TV antenna, which are at a range of VHF frequencies, down to an intermediate frequency. That's over a fairly wide spectrum because TV channels are in Australia 7 MHz wide, which they were for analog. I think the United States they were 6 MHz wide, Europe 8 MHz wide. So you are converting incoming signals down to a range of frequencies. There are different standards by country, but generally speaking, intermediate frequencies were around 30 to 40 megahertz. So, yep, yeah, basically all it was was a converter. And the channels change the local oscillator frequencies. If you're not familiar with a converter, Here's the block diagram for one. Incoming signals, VHF from the TV antenna. There's a RF preamplifier that amplifies the signals, makes them a bit stronger. A mixer stage, and down here is a local oscillator. This local oscillator is fixed frequency on each channel so that when you change the channel switch the local oscillator frequency varies it's a series of fixed frequencies here in australia we had on vhf 13 channels so for each position of the channel change switch there is a different local oscillator frequency the other thing that's changed with the channel change switch is there'll be some filtering here that filtering is selective and is different for each TV channel. The filtering has to admit a range of frequencies, in our case 7 MHz wide, and reject anything outside it. If it doesn't do that, then the TV is liable to be picking up interference. This is another tuner, different but quite similar to the one that I'm using. It's again all solid state. All the coils are here, and there's a lot of them. Each channel has its own coil. Some of them will be for the front end, some for the local oscillator. And when you change the channel like that, that switches different coils. So that allows you to change the frequency or the channel. you can tell which coils apply to which channels because the coils with the most turns are highest inductance which is lowest frequency and the one where my thumb is is channel zero down around 45 to 52 megahertz and whereas up here there's only a few turns on each coil this is for channel 11 around 210, 220 megahertz. You can see that here on the dial with zero right next to 11. Right here, if you look closely, and I'm pointing to them, 
there's little cogs with what appear to be brass screws these align with the fine tuning and if you screw the screws in and out that varies the frequency and the fine tuning is required because these things were not completely stable they sometimes drifted so if you adjusted the fine tuning you would get it exactly on channel and there are these slugs for every channel change position it's hard to see here but when I press this in and turn it the cogs change and that allows you to adjust the fine tuning but only for the channel that the TV is set to you can just see when I push it in the fine tuning is only activated when I've got this pushed in otherwise turning it around doesn't do anything we have the local oscillator signal coming into the mixer combining with the incoming signal from the TV station and then at the output of the mixer we have a signal which is a range of frequencies in the 30 to 40 megahertz region which is our intermediate frequency and I won't talk about all that but that's what the rest of the TV circuitry does converts the intermediate frequency into audio and video signals sends the audio signal to the speaker sends the video signal to the picture tube as it was then now the local oscillator frequency it could be either below or above the incoming signal frequency in this case it is above that's normally is the case so that if you have a TV channel on let's say 200 megahertz your intermediate frequency here is 30 megahertz then your local oscillator will probably be around 230 megahertz now this is a VHF only tuner some TVs earlier on had dual tuners uh, both VHF and UHF and to pick up UHF you would have to put the VHF tuner to a position often marked U on the channel change switch and that would enable the UHF tuner which I think is a separate tuner and converter and that allows you to pick up UHF signals If you look here though, there's no U setting, so this is purely from a VHF only TV. Now TV channels are different in different countries. Here in Australia you had channel 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5A, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and there ought to be an 11. Um, doesn't show but yeah there should be a channel 11 maybe it's a position just here the interesting thing about TV frequencies in Australia is that they were quite badly planned they first of all planned I think 10 channels when TV started in 1956 we were quite late for that as well but then they found they needed more channels uh, either to add country stations or extra commercial stations in the city so in about 1961 they changed the channeling system so that instead of having 10 channels they had 13 and they altered the frequencies of some existing channels a little bit so you could still receive them but in other cases they inserted new channels and some of the inserted new channels were in the FM broadcast band. It was very short-sighted. It was a problem that took decades to sort out. But it made it that Australia was also very late to FM broadcasting. We didn't get it until the 1970s. 
and even then it was only quite limited and only really got established with commercial stations in the 1980s and early 1990s. But yet there was a time where FM radio couldn't be expanded because of all the TV stations using those same frequencies. And that's our channels 3, 4 and 5. It also meant though, if you were in an area where you had channels like 3, 4 and 5, like I was, um, you could actually hear the sound of the TV stations on an FM broadcast receiver. So there was a little side of benefit there. Another thing unusual about our VHF frequencies, um, the lower channels were VHF low band. That was also used in countries like the United States. The high channels were VHF high band, like about 170 to 220 megahertz. But we also had a channel zero, and that was 45 to 52 megahertz. It wasn't a particularly good channel because there was often interference, like when cars drove past, um, it, it was quite susceptible to that. But from our point of view as amateurs, it was a problem because it meant that we lost uh, 50 to 52 megahertz. Other countries had 50 megahertz, we did not. We had our amateur band at 52 to 54 megahertz, and even that could create TV interference problems, as there is a TV channel right next door on Channel O in some cities like Melbourne and Brisbane. Another curiosity about the Australian TV channel plan is channel 5A, 137 to 144 megahertz. So that's between the aircraft band and the two meter amateur band. And that was also a problem in some areas. 5A was generally only used in some country areas. But anyway, that's all history. Those TV channels are no longer used. Uh, what we've got now is just VHF high band, and UHF. But one benefit of having these TV channels in or near amateur bands is that we can actually use these tuners for amateur band reception with almost no modification. Because after all, 45 to 52, um, you've got 50 megahertz, so you don't need to change anything there. And 137 to 144, that's near enough to the two motor band that the front end is reasonably sensitive still on the two meter band 144 to 148. So if you keep watching I'll talk a bit about that in more detail including a demonstration of receiving two meter amateur band signals. This TV tuner is effectively a converter black box. There are not too many connections which means that if you find one of these it's quite easy to get it into operation. Just where my thumb is, there is originally TV ribbon cable that went to the 300 ohm TV ribbon connections. I've just attached two wires here. Uh, this is what I will be connecting the antenna to. Strictly speaking, I should have a balance, a 4 to 1 or 6 to 1, so I've got a 50 ohm antenna input. But I think we'll see if we can get away without it. Here is coaxial cable uh, that was already coming out of the tuner and I've just attached it to a BNC connection and I'll feed this into the receiver I'll be using for the intermediate frequency. Uh, the receiver that you need for that is one that covers roughly 30 to 40 megahertz although it helps if it goes either side for reasons I will explain more. So if you've got a receiver that covers from say 20 to 40 to 50 megahertz, then that will be okay. It should receive AM, FM um, as a minimum. My Yaesu FT817 is suitable for that. Now, other connections. Uh, this is the inner of the coax. I've talked about that. That's the one that goes to the intermediate frequency. Right here, um, I'm not sure if this is original or not, but I've kept it. Um, just under this heat shrink is, is a diode, just a DC power diode. This is the power supply. It's probably hard to see, but it is marked B+. So I'm not sure what voltage this uses. I will try 12 volts. 
I've read later on that some tuners use 9, but anyway, I'll try 12 volts, and that will be the power source. Another connection, the green wire here, that is connected to the case, and that's the earth connection. So, yeah, we've got here 12 volts on the orange wire, negative on the green wire. So that's the power sorted out. Another connection is, it says AGC. I wasn't sure what to do with that initially, but it is quite important. The AGC sets the gain of this converter, so if you, if you put a voltage on it, the gain may be low or high, um, and you can adjust it. So what I did was I've got this 50 ohm potentiometer, and I put the two ends of it, one is connected to the earth, the other is connected to your plus 12 volts, and then tapped off the middle is this AGC pin. I'll give you a bit of a sneak peek of why I did that. When I first got this working, I found that it worked, but the sensitivity was poor. That's because I had nothing connected to the AGC pin. Then I accidentally put my fingers across from the AGC pin to the 12 volt power, and the sensitivity went right up and a weak signal became very, very strong. So I made that a bit more permanent with this potentiometer so I could vary the voltage. And I found that sensitivity was maximum with this potentiometer midway. Later TVs had instead uh, Veractor diodes and they might have had slider things that you could set to particular channels and you could program them. But yeah, this is just simple rotary tuner with 13 channels in the VHF range. Um, I mentioned before that Australian channels, you know, some of them like zero was near the six meter amateur band, 5A near the two meter amateur band. If you are in another country, then your TV channels will be a bit different. So the things that I do and demonstrate in this video, you might not be able to do yourself. Uh, depends on, on frequencies. I should mention that TV manufacturers in most countries have standardised their intermediate frequencies. In Australia, for vision, it was 36.875 MHz and for sound, 31.375. Now, the interesting thing about that is that the sound intermediate frequency is lower than the vision intermediate frequency. And the difference between them is 5.5 megahertz. Um, that might be different in different countries. I think it is. They've got slightly different standards. But anyway, there'll always be a difference between the vision carrier and the sound carrier. In our case, the vision carrier being a higher frequency, 5.5 megahertz above the sound carrier. The interesting thing with that is if you have a look at channel 5A, which is that channel that was unusual for Australia and quite near the 2 meter amateur band, its vision carrier is 1.25 megahertz above the lower channel edge, so 138.25 megahertz, and its sound carrier is 250 kilohertz below the top edge of 144, so 143.75. Now the interesting thing about that is that the sound carrier is 5.5 megahertz above the vision carrier. Whereas if you look at the intermediate frequency, it's the other way around. The vision carrier is the higher frequency. Now, how is that so? Well, if we go back to the diagram here of the incoming signal, coming in, um, let's say it's channel 5A, 137 to 144 megahertz. The local oscillator is above the reception frequency. So it would be, say, 170 megahertz in, in that region. And so if we got 170, 175 megahertz, subtracting the incoming frequency and we get the IF of um, 31.375 for sound, 
or 36.875 for vision. And because we're doing a subtracting with the local oscillator frequency being higher than the incoming signal, the subtracting flips things around. So that is why at the IF, the vision frequency is the, or oh, the vision carrier is the higher frequency, whereas with the incoming signal, it's the other way around. What this means is that if you're using a tunable receiver as an IF, which we'll be doing later on, it means that if you go higher in frequency, you'll actually be covering a lower frequency coming in. And conversely, if you are on a lower frequency, then you will be receiving a higher frequency. The great thing about this is that as we're using LC filters, we're not using crystal or ceramic filters, and the sensitivity of these converters or tuners is quite high. This means that even though you might be trying to receive signals outside the TV channel range, your sensitivity will often still be quite good. So you might be able to get different signals outside the TV range, which is good, especially now that all the TV signals have gone digital. So if this is going to be useful at all for anything, then there might be some interesting signals like amateur signals or aircraft signals just outside the TV range that you may still be able to hear with this converter. Now we've got the tuner set up using a Yaesu FT817 as the tunable IF. That's suitable because it covers a receiving frequency range of 30 to 40 megahertz and quite a lot either side. I'm just using a 12 volt battery that powers both the FT817 and the tuner. I'm not doing much as an antenna. I'm just using a clip lead about 50 or 60 centimeters long. Here's the AGC pot. I'll demonstrate that later on. And the black lead just goes into the antenna socket of the FT817. Now on channel five and just tuning around just above 30 megahertz. We have a station here. I've got the receiver on FM. The 817 receiver does not do wide deviation FM on this frequency. So it's very distorted. But you can get an idea of what's being transmitted, even if you can't understand it. The Baofeng handheld here happens to receive FM. And that same station is much clearer. It's on 107.5, which is the top end of the broadcast band. Now we'll just go 800 kilohertz up on the tunable IF here. There we go, that's about 800 kilohertz up. Triple J. And we'll go down here. Very distorted, but you can identify that's the right station there. Spaniels with Pookie 
Hudson on lead, but this is from a jukebox, a jukebox Treasures release in 1993, and it's called. Okay, we are. At 31.469, we'll call it 31.470 megahertz. Uh, this is a known frequency, we know that is accurate. The incoming station is on 106.7, that's also a known frequency and accurate. So, what we'll do is we'll add them and see what frequency we get. and it's 138.17 megahertz. We've now established that the local frequency in here when it's on channel 5 is 138.17 megahertz. If I want to change it I can adjust the fine tuning but for now I won't. I'm still on channel 5 so the local oscillator frequency should be around 138.17. The FT817 fortunately covers that frequency, so we'll see if we can hear anything. There it is. It's drifted a bit, 138.204, but yeah, very strong signal. And if I move the fine tuning, then it drifts off. So we've established our local oscillator here is 138.2 approximately. That's on channel 5. Next we'll try channel 5A because that's the one that's nearest the 2 meter amateur band. I'm on 29.900 megahertz. Transmitting on 144.050. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Now the interesting thing about this is that we are monitoring the two motor band on a receiver that's within the 10 meter amateur band. So if you had a tuner like this you could use an HF general coverage receiver to be picking up 2 meter amateur signals. Not only that, but it's backward tuning. So right now we are at just above 144 megahertz. If we go down then to say 26 megahertz, we're near 148 megahertz. So 26 to 30 megahertz translates as roughly 148 to 144. So that allows reception of 2 meter amateur signals on a general coverage receiver or potentially even a 27 meg CB radio depending on the frequencies. I'll now tune around and see if you can get any actual amateur signals. Bearing in mind I'm still using the short piece of wire outside as an antenna. Radio Victoria. Press 1 for the instruction menu. Otherwise, please hold the mic. Well, that is VK3RCW on 145.650 megahertz. This is the converter connected up to a proper outside antenna. Although I'm a bit slack with the impedance matching. 
there being no balun between the 300 ohm input and the 50 ohm coax cable going to the antenna. This is the VK3 RGL beacon. You can hear their significant drift. Just adjusting the fine tuning. Yeah, you could probably tune in an SSB signal with this. Let's have a quick tune around. First of all, we'll tune down in frequency, which means that we are tuning up in frequency. Here's the Morse beacon again. I'll just demonstrate what happens when you adjust the AGC voltage. This is with zero volts. And just tuning across, you can hardly hear the beacon. And when you go further up, it also drops off. So there's a certain sweet spot that you want the AGC voltage to be at. Call 26 meg 148, it'll probably be a bit inaccurate. Another narrow car station, this is around 152. There's a repeater. Psychotic drivers. Uh, no, that's the road I wanted. I'm going to have to enter the freeway and come back. Uh, go on, over. No, you go. It's just something that I didn't know existed. Over.
But if we keep going up in the IF, we keep going down in the frequency, and we'll get to the aircraft band. So I've just put it on AM, and we'll see if we hear any aircraft signals. Notice the noise has dropped. Uh, getting away from the centre frequency. is 128.9 so that's uh, a local airport I'll now do is go to channel 6 channel 6 is I think 
4 to 181 megahertz. There could be some interesting activity there. Here we are around 161, 162 megahertz, I think. Hear this sort of stuff. This is the VK3RCW Morse beacon. Below that was an FM signal. The FRG7 only does AM, but reception is still good. Probably better if it's kept in its widest bandwidth. up to 29 megahertz that's a two meter beacon now I should mention that I'm using a vertically polarized antenna to receive it so if I had a horizontal polarized antenna it would be stronger Cast narrow band FM around 152 meg. Three AUT VK3 LDR. Oh yeah, here 
story, your journey sounds a bit similar to mine when I uh, first first got licensed back in 07. I didn't stick around as a foundation for too long, but um, yeah, I tried a vertical as well at home and uh, threw it in the towel on that. I found the dive hole was the most effective. Uh, I lived in Baronia for a few years, so I, I ran a bit of a, I ran a, a fan dive hole to cover a few bands. I've ran it okay, I've, I live in Bull Park now. But, um, uh, yeah, so I've been licensed a while, but I'm not terribly active, to be honest. I also was more into HF than anything else. Active when I first changed job. I used to work in the city for many years, and then I worked out in the suburbs. So I got the radio going to the car and met a few people, and, and I uh, spoke on a couple of repeaters, and then uh, COVID hit, and, um, and we all went home. Well, a lot of us got sent home to work from home. I'm still working from home. And... Um, just repeat it from home sometimes lately. It's a pretty quiet one. SKT. Yeah, it's, um, it's a bit of a tricky one. Like, yeah, um, I had a dipole set up, which actually worked really well. I didn't really, I didn't make any contact on it, but at least I'm... Golly, you should buy a electric chicken from John. <laughs> well done. Um, uh, a very good night to you, thanks for the chat. We're in the Pine Shears Club on Sunday. Um, AK3 Tunisio, AK3 AFW. Um, now, I'm just going to make a uh, comment to you there, Tony. I'm just online for the moment. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, um, I, I presume the, um, uh, the tip that you were talking about was um, in um, some, somewhere uh, around Hobart, perhaps it was further afield. Uh, but, uh, uh, I, I hired a car while I was down there and, uh, oh golly, the, uh, those one-way streets got me uh, um, very uh, irritated on the first day. stable is this tuner? I left it going for about two hours with the CB on a repeater. It was near enough in frequency to still hear the repeater and break the mute. Now there's 
a SSB net, so I'll tune down there and see if I can hear people on that frequency. The SSB net is 144.150. Here we are, 144.530. The tuning is backwards, so it would be a bit hard to find it. This is 144 144.4, 144.3, 144.2, and 144.15 will be around here. Now, there's something around here. the mode on upper sideband but because of the inversion it's possible that it will need to be lower sideband to be resolving these signals. That sounds like VK3MQ. I'll just go outside and swing the beam and see if I can improve the signal. I'll just go over to the FT817 so you can compare the reception. Okay, that's VK3 A8 AXH talking. I'll just swing the beam. There is something there, but it's very low down. We'll go back to the TV tuner and FRG7. Like that. I think I've got a 
This has been an interesting experiment. The sensitivity of this setup is excellent, and the stability was surprisingly good. 
although it did drift noticeably on SSB and you definitely wouldn't use it on digital modes. If you're looking for a simple way to receive signals on two motors, whether it be FM, SSB or whatever, then these days you're much better off to use a computer and a USB dongle like this. But for the novelty value, if you've got an old TV tuner, especially if you're in Australia and we have TV channels 5A near 2 meters and channel O near 6 meters, then you can use one of these as the front end to put before a 30 to 40 megahertz receiver or a little bit more either side and you too can start receiving amateurs. Thanks to Tony VK6TG for putting me onto it. It worked first time and it's been a lot of fun.